Christ. He does a body good. Amen. Amen. So if you weren't here last week, I'll recap a little, but you can also go and view online. Um, have you, do you, does anybody know anyone that, that is prideful? Arrogant? All right. Think of their self more highly than they ought. Uh-huh. It, it could be at church, work, family, friends. We all know somebody that's prideful, that's arrogant, right? Okay, so what about you or me? Hmm? We don't always see that in ourselves, amen? Can you look at yourself and say, I have been arrogant or prideful? Hmm? So in the body of Christ, we're assigned different gifts. Sometimes those gifts cause us to be prideful or arrogant. But as we learned last week, it is God that gives the gifts, right? So what do we need to do? Here's what Paul says. This morning, we're going to focus a lot, and we're going to live in verse 3. Last week, we lived in verses 4 through 8. We laid foundation. We talked about the body. We talked about how Paul was using the physical body as an analogy of how the the body of Christ should work together and also how they should relate, how the body of Christ relates to Christ. So last week, if you weren't here, we looked at this letter that Paul wrote to Rome. And in this letter, he's explaining the gospel and he's showing that salvation is for all humankind. And, and in this church, he was writing to, there were Jews and Gentiles that that um, were together um, in the church together, and he's showing that them that they are one body in Christ. Christ died for everyone. Christ saved everyone. And so as a believer, we form one body in Christ. And then we said this, Christ, he does a body good. He does a body good. So we also learned that God allots or he distributes or he assigns our gifts as he sees fit and as he purposes. Why? Because he does a body good. And then we saw that the Holy Spirit is the one that, that bestows the gifts, that empowers us, that he is the one that causes us to fulfill our gifts. Now, I do want to clear something up that we talked about on Wednesday night because I mentioned that at the point of salvation, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we are given at least one spiritual gift. So someone asked the question about uh, prior to salvation, sometimes, and a lot of times this will happen, and as we look back over our lives, we will see that the hand of God was on us all the time. Right? And we can see where we were functioning, perhaps, in that particular gift. For example, if you have the gift of teaching, perhaps there was this passion, or perhaps you were already teaching in that gift prior to your salvation. But once you're saved, it's the Holy Spirit that empowers. It's the Holy Spirit that guides and leads. It's no longer you or I, but it's the Holy Spirit. So today... We're going to see how our gifts press us to function as one fit, healthy body. Is that all right? Is that all right? Amen. We're going to look and see how our gifts press us to function as one fit, healthy body. At salvation, we became a part of the body. Immediately. Immediately. And so when we get to chapter 12, Paul begins to show us how we walk out our salvation, how we live it out. And so he begins by saying this. 
immediately when we become a part of the body of Christ, we must consecrate ourselves by giving our own lives to God as a spiritual act of worship. And then he says, don't conform to the ways of the world, but be transformed, listen, by the renewing of our minds. And so let's go to our first point. We're not to conform to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So basically what Paul is teaching is that as members of the body of Christ, if we're going to function as one body, we need to have a renewed mindset. Let's look at our mindset this morning. Verse 3. I'm going to read it again in the ESV. It says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. That word think, he says it three times. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think of yourself with sober judgment. We're going to look at some Greek words again this morning. Amen. Did y'all learn something from last week? Yeah, hold them in your heart. Here, here's a, here's a uh, Greek word for to think. It's phroneo. Now I'm going to have y'all, y'all going to have to talk back. Okay. Phroneo. Roll your R. Phroneo. Phroneo. That means to think. That means we need to change our mindset. Amen. That's what Paul is saying. And so, who bear, who bear phroneo? I practice, y'all. Who bear phroneo? It means to think more highly. So, phroneo means to think with a sound mind. And so as members of the body of Christ, we should function with a renewed mindset. It's interesting that the first thing Paul addresses is our hooper, phroneo. This Greek word, it actually means, has to do with pride and arrogance. And he's saying, do not... Think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Now, one thing about the mind is that it doesn't think the way God wants it to think, right? Hence, it has to be renewed. Hence, a renovation has to take place in the mind. Why? Because our mind is vital, Free your mind and the rest will follow. Y'all know that song, right? <laughs> but it's so true. If we can change our mindset, the rest will follow. <laughs> right? So the mind is vital. We have to make conscious, intentional decisions whether to accept or reject Christ. The mind is vital. We have to make intentional Decisions whether to maintain communication with God or whether to not maintain communication with God. We have to make intentional decisions to make a commitment to God or to not make a commitment to God. The mind is vital. We must change our mindset. We, have, we make intentional decisions whether to obey, whether to disobey. We make intentional decisions whether to go right or to go left. We make intentional decisions to be nice or to be mean. We make intentional decisions whether to eat healthy or to eat a lot of junk food. We, the mind is vital. Amen? Paul says in chapter 8 of Romans, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. 
but to set the mind on the spirit, guess what? It's life and it's peace. As members of the body of Christ, we must adjust our mind, renew our mind. We must change our thinking. So we'll look at this word, huper, freneo. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Don't think proudly. Don't think arrogantly. Don't think too highly. We must drop the pride and function in our gifts with a humble attitude. Donna said we were Baptists. <laughs> and, and actually, we know each other because we both directed a choir. We both directed choirs. That's how we knew each other. Because back then, baby, if you directed a choir, you were something, okay? So I used to direct, right? <laughs> And, and, and honestly, I really put in a lot of work in trying to perfect that gift. And it wasn't about just directing or leading the choir or leading the band. You know, it was similar to a worship leader, worship pastor. But I would take the time and, and go through the, the scriptures and, and try to apply the music to the word so we can understand what we're singing about. I put in a lot of work. I did this for five years. Now, I'm usually a shy, a quiet person. So to stand in front of people was an humbling experience. And as time went on, of course, I got better. And, and, and People knew me from other churches because of what I did. And so in my mind, I did never thought that I was being prideful. I thought I was working for the Lord. I, but one day, um, my pastor asked me not to direct anymore. Now, no explanation. Just don't direct no more. So what was that about? I have no idea. So sometimes our pride and our arrogance is not always how we're acting in the moment, but it can be our response to how we act when we're not doing what we think we should be doing. I, so how did I respond? I got mad, I was hurt. I was angry. I was um, disappointed. Yep, that's a good word, disappointed. Also, I became, um, I became, uh, um, I'm trying to think of this word, rebellious. That's it. I became rebellious. All of this over time because in my mind, I knew what I was doing and I was good at it. And who are you to stop me from doing what the Lord has called me to do? And I will tell you something that I stayed at that church for 15 years. Five of it I was a director. I spent the next 10 years sitting in the choir stand, angry, hurt, and rebellious. I never directed again. Hyper. Hooper, freneo. Hooper, freneo. Now, so my pride was my response. My arrogance was my response. Because obviously, now that I look back on it, obviously God knew how I was going to respond. And he needed to form and shape and renew my mind. And so he allowed those things to happen. How are you responding? How are you responding? Somebody may have got demoted on their job. How are you responding? Somebody probably used to lead and now they have to be led. How is your response? Our pride and our arrogance is not always uh, uh, being know-it-all and, and, and thinking we know everything, but it's also in our response. But God, he, he, he knows our future. He knows our motives. He knows what we're going to do before we're going to do it. And so he puts things in place. 
I may not have been standing here. I don't know. But because of my response, the body was handicapped. The body was handicapped. Remember, we talked about that last week. If we're not doing, we're not in our place, then we're handicapping the body. And so Paul is saying that we must, as members of the body of Christ, we must function with the attitude of humility. What is that? Humility is the lowly, true self-estimate. It's a lowly, true self-estimate. Listen to this, and you might want to write it down. It's the acceptance of the place God appointed. Oh, I said something there, y'all. Come on. It's the acceptance of the place God appointed. And I know somebody probably said, well, God probably didn't appoint it, but he allowed it. He either appoints or he allows. Humility. It's the acceptance of the place that God appointed. Write this down. It's the emptiness of self which God feels. That was good. Come on. I didn't make it up. I didn't make it up. So go ahead and give whoever God gave it to. Give God some praise. It's the emptiness of self which God feels. God might have, have you in the front or the rear, but it's accepting his order to fulfill what he has purposed. And we must do it with a humble attitude. So as members of the body of Christ, change our mindset. You and I change our mindset. How do we do that? We can imitate Christ. We can imitate Christ. Paul wrote to the Philippians in chapter 2. He said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. He said, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others in your relationship with one another. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a listen servant being made in human likeness being found in appearance as a man he listen humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should acknowledge or confess that Jesus Christ is Lord in the glory of God hallelujah Christ here's how he had a humble attitude he took off his crown crown he took off his robe he got up off of his throne he came down as the old preacher would say through 20 and 4 generations he was born in a lowly manger and he could have he could have been taken from he could have called they said 10,000 angels to take him from the cross he could have but he accepted the call on his life and it's not always glamorous that gift is not always glamorous Hallelujah. Everybody's not going to get to stand up in front of people. Somebody got to be the baby toe. You see, the baby toe helps balance the body. <laughs> Somebody got to be the baby toe. Hallelujah. Christ does a body good, don't he? Yeah. And so... Paul says this, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but, here's, here's a transition, but think with sober judgment. So, phroneo, a sound mind. That word so 
it, it's come from the word sound, but it also comes from the word sozo, which means saved. But have a saved mind, a mind like Christ Jesus. This idea of a sound mind is, is, is a sober mind. Now, I've been drunk before. <laughs> I've been high before, illegally and legally. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean legal marijuana. I meant legal drugs. <laughs> sorry, I don't, I don't want y'all to think I smoke weed. I don't. Not now, I used to. Okay, but anyway, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been drunk, I've been high, I've had medications, and, and think about it, your mind is not sound and right, right? You think things that you wouldn't normally think. Sometimes you do things that in your right mind you wouldn't do. So this sound mind is, is a sober mind. It's a sober mind. So, so we have to, to put on moderate, a moderate estimate of ourselves is what it says. It, 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 a sober mind is to curb our passions. A sober mind, it means to reason and think properly in a sane manner. It means to have an understanding about practical matters. It's a recognition in ourselves that we can do nothing. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches, and in, without me you can do nothing. A sober mind, we must acknowledge that, that in Christ we are going to be used to the glory of God. We can think reasonably. A sober mind is a secure mind, a sound mind. And something else about it, when we talked about the mind a few minutes ago, we can make intentional decisions. We can be disciplined. We can be self-controlled in a sober mind. A sound mind understands that every good and perfect gift comes from above. Amen. Doesn't Christ do a body good? He knows what we need when we need it, who we are, how we can function, if we're going to accept, if we're going to um, reject. He already knows all of that. So as members of the body of Christ, we are assigned different gifts. And guess what? To press us to function as one fit health body, healthy body. So let's put our second members of the body of Christ should function as the Lord determines or wills. Huh. I'm going to contend that it's in the press. God's determination, God's will, it's, it's in the press. He wants us to function as one healthy body. He presses us to do it. He presses us. We have to change our mindset. We're going to see how he determines, how he wills, how he presses. Again, verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned Last week we talked about God distributing the gifts. He's the one. We don't ask for it. It's by his grace. We don't earn it. We don't work for it. He assigns it as he, see fit, as he sees fit for a common good. The body of Christ, the church, is, a, is, is what God has determined to be a, 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 a redemptive agent in the world. It's God. It's not you. It's not me. So listen, here is the press. 
He said, Paul says, think with sober judgment according to the measure of faith. The measure of faith. Now, I'm not talking about, or he's not talking about, you know, Pastor Karen got a thumble full of faith, and Pastor Ned, wow, she got a bucket full. Pastor Felix, he got a boatload full, right? It's not talking about measure in those terms. So listen, listen carefully. This may sound a little confusing, but I'll do an illustration to, to straighten it out. The measure of faith is the truth that each believer can know the limitations of their gift. I'm going to say that again. The measure of faith is the truth or a truth that each believer can know the limitations of their gift. God has given the gift and then he gives us the faith to discern our limits in our gifts. Okay, that sounds really weird. Okay, let's look at our physical body. If y'all weren't here last week, I, I said that, and I, I was like, I was imagining my body to look like Beyonce before the twins. So this week, I'm imagining my body to look like Janet Jackson after she had her baby because her homegirl lost 60 pounds and worked it out. But anyway, let's look at our physical body. Imagine our physical body. Since Paul's using it as an analogy, and it has many members, right? And they all function together. So as the body of Christ, we are a member or a part of the body, and we should all work together. So Paul is saying, um, according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So look at your hand. Your hand can only do or is limited to do what a hand can do. It can do nothing else. The measure of faith. We used an illustration of eating food last week of how the body functioned together, but check this out. If I was sitting down eating and I picked up a fork full of food, I would use it Use my hand because only my hand can do that function. It's limited to grabbing and holding. I wouldn't grab a fork with my elbow. My hand is limited to do what it is created to do. I put the food in my mouth. I wouldn't put the food in my nose. Because my mouth is limited to do only what it's created to do. I, I wouldn't taste the food with my ear. My ear is limited to hearing. My tongue is limited to what it can do. And so the body functions together because we all have a part and we must do what we've been created to do because we're limited to that. We're limited to that function. Oh, maybe you didn't get it. Let's listen to this parable. Suppose your eye could say to your body, let us walk down these train tracks. The way is all clear. Not a train is in sight. So you begin to walk down the tracks. Then suppose your ear says to the body, I hear a whistle coming from the other direction. Your body argues, but nothing is on the track as far as I can see. Let's keep walking. So your body listens only to your eye and keeps on walking. Soon your ear says, that whistle is getting louder and closer. Then your feet say, I can feel the rumbling motion of a train coming. We better get our body 
off these tracks. Now, will we get off the track as soon as possible? Will we take a vote? Will we trust the eye? No, we would do, we would get off the track because every part of the body is doing what it has been assigned to do. <laughs> Members of the body of Christ should function as the Lord determines or wills. We have to change our mindset. We have to function in the gift that God has given to us. And we have to do it as one unit. Don't reject the gifts. Don't reject the gifts. Don't reject the gifts. Let me tell you, uh, sometimes, especially in the church, people want the pastor to do everything. The pastor might be gifted to teach and not gifted to, to come and love on you and, 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 and do the caring that's needed. But he might send a, a minister topaz who's gifted to love and care over to your house. Or he might send a Suzette that'll love on you and make you feel so warm and fuzzy inside. And he might not come. Don't reject the gifts because those gifts are designed to do what they are designed to do. Amen. So God is pressing us. It's as if he's pressing us, isn't it? It's as if he's forcing us to work together as a body because not one person has all the gifts. The hand can't do everything that the whole body can do. It's like he created it. It is like he created us that way so that we can work together in unity. It's called this, this weird, weird word, mutually interdependent. That means that we're all mutually dependent on one another. I can't do this without Jackie calling me and praying over me. I can't do this without pastor training and teaching. We have to work together as one body. And if somebody is out of place, if somebody is, is, is prideful, if somebody is disabling the body, the body is handicapped. And the world cannot be drawn unto Christ if we're not functioning as a healthy, fit body. We know, we look on the news every day. Okay, and, and here's something that we, we have to understand is that you don't join the body of Christ. You're born into it. You're birthed into it. And then you're given a gift. And your gift causes you to fit into the body, which causes the body to function as it should. Christ does a body good. So I got the slogan, and I, I mentioned this last week from a commercial that was in the 90s, and it said, milk it does a body good. And it was to encourage kids to drink milk. And, and it showed a scrawny kid drinking milk and he'd get, and add, the more he drank, the, the bigger and the healthier and the fitter he would become. Come on, worship team, I'm about through. And, and so uh, I said I, that we should imagine that the world is looking at the body of Christ and all they see is a little scrawny kid. And then I challenged our imagination to say, what if the body of Christ would function as they should and stand up on their feet and begin to function as God has created and called us to do? Amen. What if the hands were to go out and love on somebody? What if the feet would walk, the, would walk up and down this street here and, and hand out cards? What if the knees would be on their, their knees praying for the body of Christ and for this body? What if the ears were listening for, for a word from God? What if the eyes were discerning what God is saying and where he's working? What if? What if? 
What if the body of Christ functioned as a big, healthy, fit body? Amen. Amen. Let's give God some praise. Let's give God some praise. Let's give God some praise. And let me tell you, if you're not sure of what your gifting is, because you do have one if you've given your life to Christ, if you haven't, there are ministers at the altar, and you can come and surrender your life to God. If you want to renew your, your commitment to God, there's ministers here to pray over you. They are the knees. They are the knees. They will pray. Amen. We need the body to function together. For the world needs to see a strong, fit body. The world needs to look up and see Christ and say, wow, he does a body good. They loved me. They cared for me. They fed me when I was hungry. They gave me uh, uh, money when I was in need. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord.